Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Transcense Technology PLC AGM Investor Update. Throughout this update, investors will be in listen-only mode. Questions are encouraged and can be submitted at any time using the Q&A tab situated on the right-hand corner of your screen. Please just simply type in any question you may have throughout the duration of this presentation and uh, press send. The company may not be in a position to answer every question it receives during today's meeting. However, the company will review all questions submitted today and where appropriate, publish those responses. These will be available via your Investor Meet Company dashboard and we'll send you an email when they're ready for your review. I'd also like to remind you that this presentation or update is being recorded. Before we begin, we would like to submit the following poll, and if you would give that your kind attention, I'm sure the company would be most grateful. And I'd now like to hand over to the board from Transcense Technologies. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and thank you for the introduction, Mark, and uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, we're transmitting live from our boardroom at Western on the Green in Oxfordshire, and uh, glad to see once again a very good attendance for this session. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us. You'll see around the table we have uh, Rodney Westhead, Melvin Siegel, and we also have Nick Hopkins and Ryan Morn, and then myself at the top of the table, Nigel Rogers. You're probably used to seeing my mug on uh, online before. So um, this is a, a slightly less formal session than perhaps we've done in the past on the IMC platform, but we wanted to create an opportunity for shareholders to be able to ask questions around our AGM update, which came out this morning. Um, obviously, with COVID being as it, as it has been, there have been limited opportunities for shareholders to attend our AGM. And we wanted to make sure that there was a platform for informal questions, um, which normally we would take uh, immediately following the meeting. Um, so we've actually completed our AGM a couple of hours ago. Um, I'm pleased to say that all of the resolutions were duly carried. And that AGM came after a trading update on some very important news this morning about changes within our boardroom. So turning, first of all, to the trading update, of course, it's only eight short weeks since the last time we gave a comprehensive update at the time of our final results for last year. So relatively little has happened in that time. Um, and it is only seven weeks to our period end. So it's kind of that time of year when trading updates are quite frequent. Um, our six month period end um, it comes in December and our interim results will be published in February. Um, but having said that, we have provided a brief update this morning and the news there is that revenue is on track and meeting expectations. We continue to be profitable and cash generative. And in fact, the cash balance at the end of October was 1.34 million, uh, about 30% higher than the end of the prior year. So trading um, very much on track, but the big news today, and, and you know, frankly, more important than the short-term trading news, is some changes in our boardroom which we think are extremely significant, and we're delighted to be welcoming both Nick and Ryan to our board. And the main reason for setting this session up was really to give them a short opportunity to introduce themselves to shareholders and, and also for them to take questions. Um, we're delighted that Nick has joined the board after being with us um, for about 17 months now, and Ryan joined our SORCAP committee in December of last year, so he's now been involved with Transcends for about 11 months, um, and with effect from the 1st of December, they'll be coming into the boardroom. So I think perhaps to make a start, what I'd like to do, um, first of all, if I pick on Nick, um, is invite him to give us a short pen profile of his experience before he joined Transcends, and uh, just you know, briefly talk you through his CV, and we'll be keeping an eye on the Q&A bar to see what comes in while he's talking. Nick, over to you. Okay, thank you, Nigel. Good afternoon. So uh, my experience, I've had a, a number of years with, in the British Army as a commission officer in the Army Air Corps, where I was fortunate enough to fly helicopters as well, but also had the management and command experience. Um, but I've also had experience um, with sensor technology and learning about SOAR technology, which I think is quite useful for this um, my present uh, job. And I've also managed a communications company for a number of years uh, before um, arriving here at Transense. Thank you, Nick. And, and I think as well, people will be very interested to hear um, perhaps what you found when you joined Transense and the things that you've been able to change and achieve over the last few months. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah, so it has been a particularly interesting time, as many of you will appreciate, because we experienced the uh, COVID scenarios that we have. So it has somewhat limited our ability to get out and see people. Um, 
So, um, and obviously I've been aware of Transcend for many years, um, having worked with sensor technology. Um, but in the, in the, perhaps in some ways, a short time I've been here, a lot of it has been relationship building, um, making sure that our supply chain is uh, more enhanced there. So it's both the uh, surface acoustic wave supply chain and the ASIC supply chain. It's also establishing relationships um, with our licensees at GE, um, and then working with McLaren Applied, um, the sort of joint agreements there. And uh, many of you will uh, be aware that we um, signed a, a joint collaborative agreement with McLaren Applied not so long ago. And, and that work is um, now increasing, which is good news. Have we also employed a couple of new staff here to meet our expected inquiries and, and um, customers? Um, we have updated the website in that time and continue to work on that. And we've also updated our ISO 9001 uh, status. And I've also, over the last year, we've had benefit really under sort of Nigel's uh, leadership and management uh, with the SOAR cap. And uh, Brian's here with us as well. But what that has really helped us um, is, in fact, triaging where we are and where we think that um, SOAR technology would be best suited. Uh, and therefore, that gives us a platform really of which direction we need to go. Um, so. Um, that's really quite a lot of the work that's been happening over the last sort of 16, 17 months. Absolutely. Thank you, Nick. Um, and now perhaps I'll, I'll turn to Ryan and again ask uh, Ryan if you could just let people have a, a, a pen profile of your experience and, and track record. Sure. Uh, so my name is Ryan Morn. I, I'm an engineer by background. I began my career in the motorsport industry. Um, I went on to worked for a company that made uh, special bearings for rotating machinery. And then I set up a company called uh, Avid. Um, so Avid was involved in developing uh, components and systems for electric and hybrid vehicles. Uh, but way back in, uh, in 2004, so be before that had kind of really taken off, uh, developed and grew Avid over the years. Uh, we had a position sensor business that we sold to Continental um, in 2012, uh, span out a battery business also in 2012. And then eventually I, uh, I exited Avid um, to an American group of investors um, earlier this year. So my background is very much around um, engineering and um, the last 15 years I've spent developing uh, motor drive systems for, for different applications on hybrid and electric vehicles. Sounds good. And then joined our SOCAP committee in December. Yes. Of yeah. last year. Yeah. So perhaps you could just talk a little bit about the work of that committee over the last few months? Uh, so I think it was really interesting for me to be invited by uh, Nigel to join the SORCAP. Um, I hadn't come across Transcend's technology before. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I am based up in the northeast of England, so not too far from, from where Nigel is and our paths had crossed or, on some other business. So with my background in automotive and, and electric motors and, and drives, learning what we could uh, potentially do um, with, with a, the torque sensor, it, it, it started to get a lot of ideas flowing, um, you know, for, for me. And uh, and then we had a great, great group of people assembled around the table uh, within the SOAR cap where we could look at different uh, potential applications for the technology uh, and, and really, um, I think, as, uh, as Nick puts it, triage them and decide where the, where the key focus areas uh, were, were going to be. And, and I think, yeah, I was able to bring my experience of sort of drive system development and, and particularly in the automotive space but, and more recently a little bit in electrified uh, aircraft um, to, to that in terms of how these things could bring, bring a benefit um, to those systems and, and how maybe they're essential for safety uh, reasons or maybe they just bring another benefit like helping to improve the efficiency of a machine or a, or a vehicle. Okay, thank you. I'm, uh, I'm just now uh, starting to look at some of the questions which are coming in and uh, perhaps uh, one question area which is, is uh, certainly of interest is the relationship with GE and many people who are tuned in will know that we have a long-standing relationship with GE and there have been recently some changes within, within their organisation. I'm just going to ask Nick if, if you could just talk a little bit about um, the, the way that the relationship with GE has developed over the last few months that you've been involved, the contacts that we have within GE Aviation, and also specifically 
uh, one of our shareholders is asking about relationships within the research division of GE, GERC. Yes, so um, I'm just reading that question there now. So, yeah, not specifically involved in trials at the moment with GE uh, research, although we are in contact and we do occasionally actually speak to GE research and have over the year um, established a, a relationship with the people that are working there. We have a very good relationship um, again with the 901 program and, um, and through that, um, then the, there are probably opportunities that we can probably try and extract that technology across to some other programs as well. Thank you. Um, and uh, I think a more general update on SOAR is being requested. I mean, we, we obviously did quite a comprehensive update on um, areas of interest within surface acoustic wave just a few weeks ago, so I don't want to become repetitive, but I do think it would perhaps be interesting just to have um, Ryan's perspective briefly on where we see some of the um, brighter opportunities as far as the application of surface acoustic waves technology is concerned and, and perhaps you know what comes top of the hit list in business development over the next few weeks and months. Um, uh, yeah, sure. So uh, I think building on what Nick said, obviously there's an existing relationship with GE where it's going now into maturity. So a lot of hard work has already been done to prove the component in that aerospace application. So that's deeply embedded uh, as a key component in a control system, um, it, you know, in an aerospace application. There are lots of others like that um, that, that, that we can build off. And, and having had the experience of going through that with GE, who are one of the most you know, demanding customers, prestigious customers that you'll find in that sector, you know, that, that's a great reference point for other um, aerospace control type applications. Uh, adjacent to that, we've got a lot of activity in uh, electrified aerospace, so electric drives for helicopters and VTOL aircraft and uh, and, and planes. That's a, a huge um, growth area, and there's some quite specific requirements in terms of um, control integrity in those applications, where having a torque sensor to verify that the motor is doing what you you're expecting it to do is is really important. And, and efficiency is really important in those applications as well. So aerospace is, is a really interesting space uh, for, for this. And I think, um, you know, more, more kind of automotive, like heavy duty uh, truck and off highway machinery, those kinds of applications as well, where again, efficiency is really critical. Um, and there can be a, a, as well a requirement from a sort of safety verification angle. This could be used, obviously, more and more electrified vehicles coming through. Um, and there's a, a sort of normal way of measuring the performance of an electric motor. Putting a torque sensor on there gives you a whole other um, set of control possibilities uh, that, that you can look at. So in, in, in those applications as well, and just in complex uh, industrial machinery. So, you know, any system where you've got lots of moving parts, basically, um, the, the ability to have an embedded torque sensor that's robust and reliable um, and is going to live the, the life of the machine is, uh, is is really interesting. So, you know, three, three kind of big focus areas there with, with plenty to go at, um, which are, you know, particularly when we look at electrification, the, the big, big growth areas. Thank you. Um, I'm picking up a question which is coming in um, from Michael. Uh, which is about supply chain issues and supply chain risks. And I think we'll, we'll probably take that <coughs> question in two parts, Michael. Um, the, the first part, I think we'll talk specifically about the SOAR supply chain, which is obviously um, dedicated component suppliers and largely relationship built. And perhaps Nick will talk a little bit about, uh, you know, obviously in quite generic terms, some of the work that's been done there. In terms of more general supply chain risks affecting um, the more commodity electronics that we purchase, and I'm thinking there are components for our probes, but also for the ATM, ATMS iTrack kit, then perhaps I might just ask Melvin to talk a little bit about the work that's been done to mitigate the supply chain there. So perhaps first on, on Sony, just... Um, yes, so the way I sort of read that question also is the fact that it applied perhaps much more to the, uh, the probe and that I, I think it's sort of supply think, chain. Um, so from our supply chain, I mean, predominantly, obviously, it's obviously to license technology and then to license the supply chain uh, through that. And there are really no supply chain issues in that uh, because we're quite sort of bespoke. You know, we're a supplier for the um, saw devices, the all quartz packages. 
and a, a supply chain for our ASIC as well. So um, th there aren't really any, any issues on that in the way that one has read in the press about the, the component shortages Absolutely. there. So we're okay. Thank you. And, and okay, well, so far as the probe is concerned, um, obviously this has come at exactly the same time that the demand for the probe is actually increasing. Um, but we have been aware of this. It's a global issue and we have been building up our stock numbers and you'll probably see that come the end of December um, and trying to mitigate the problem by building up the stock numbers. We, we have found that the cost of certainly processes has increased because of the shortage but we, being mindful of the problem we have started as I say building up our stock numbers and preparing for it. Um, but um, so far as uh, the current situation is concerned, we have sufficient stock to deal with the existing demand, which, as I mentioned, at the beginning is an increasing demand on the pro side of the business. Thank you, Melvin. Um, a couple of more uh, um, financially orientated questions, if you like, as well, which Melvin and I have perhaps answered between us. So um, a question from Brian King, which is that, at the time of the Bridgestone transaction, uh, we were talking about the uh, saw business seeking to be at break even within 18 months. Um, and he's asking whether that's still an aspiration and still on track. Well, um, you know, as I think we've discussed before, uh, the, the short term financial drivers of the business are far more dependent, in fact, on success in the other two areas of the business. And, the surface acoustic wave business is still at a stage where we are priming the pump for the future and we recognize that that involves um, a degree of financial investment. Uh, we are still looking at short-term drivers for profitability in surface acoustic wave and I think you know, of particular interest and one of the major themes of Nick's leadership of the business over the last few months has been to expect customer funded programs to come to the fore and do far less speculative work than the company had a reputation for in the past. And so I think that it, you know, it will become an increasing feature of our business that customers um, and or grant assistance will fund some of the development work that we do and will have to be self-funded to a much lesser degree. In terms of time scale to profit, then uh, the Allenby research note is still showing us investing in the sole business up to the end of June 2023. The financial year 2023 is, is still showing that as being a cash negative business. Um, so it ought not come to a surprise um, if that's the case. However, um, it, it is uh, inherent in our financial structure, in our own management of the business and in the incentive plans that we have in place for Nick and others, that that business um, will become profitable in the short to medium term. Uh, the next question I want to pick up is in relation to Bridgestone and whether there's any news on the acquisition of Otraco. Um, and the answer to that is unfortunately there isn't. It's still expected that that transaction will complete by the end of the year, but it's with competition authorities and others at the moment. Um, but we still expect that that transaction will complete in time to get a good run at it in 2022. And uh, you know, we are aware in the background that there are some very good preparation uh, strategies in place for when that deal is uh, finally consummated. So we still have great high hopes of that being able to provide extra volume for the ATM SI track business uh, next year. Um, is anybody picking up any questions I'm missing here? There's one from Jordan R which has just disappeared, <laughs> okay, okay, it has dropped down. Um, have you given guidance or a range on what iTrack revenues will likely be at maturity? Uh, the answer to that is, is no, we haven't. Um, it is something that I think is of interest to the Ian Jeremy who does our research note, and maybe it's something he will look at when he does the next research note, where we've got a couple of years um, of eye track revenues under our belt, he, he might be able to then extrapolate that and give some sort of idea. But so far as us as a company, no, we haven't. Um, uh, another question, which I think was pre submitted on the platform, uh, was uh, surrounding the company's policy as far as buybacks or dividends are concerned. I mean, clearly, we're now in a position where we have distributable reserves. 
and uh, by virtue of being profitable and now starting to gather some cash reserves in the company as well. And so uh, there was a question on the platform as to what the board's stance was in terms of balancing the opportunity for share buybacks against the opportunity to pay dividends. Um, we have signaled that by FY23, that is by the financial year end of 30th of June 2023, we expect to be in a position to uh, expand on our dividend policy and uh, at that stage communicate how we would intend to allocate any surplus cash and surplus distributable reserves between buybacks in the, in the form of uh, effectively a return of capital uh, or dividend policy. I think that you know, clearly the extent to which the value of the company is reflected in the share price is bound to have an impact on our tactics as far as buybacks are concerned. However, we're also mindful that the shares are already very closely held and so to um, execute buybacks would actually exacerbate that situation as well and does create some volatility in the share price. Volatility in the share price is an opportunity if you're buying low. So um, certainly that's something which we as directors have taken the opportunity to do from time to time. And I know many of our smaller shareholders have as well. And um, the question is to if and when the company is in a position to do that is one for the future. I believe there was a question relating to the cash balance at the end of October as to whether that included the royalty. And the answer was yes, it did, because the royalties are paid one month after the uh, quarter end. So whilst when we report in December and June, our cash is generally at its low point, the following month our cash is generally at one of its higher points. Um, so yes, it does include. There's a question from Simon C, which is an interesting one. What do we see as our greatest risk and opportunity to the business moving forward? <coughs> Yeah, I mean, discussing business risks are a, a topic which has changed enormously over the last couple of years because I didn't actually see a global pandemic on any company's <laughs> list of risks, um, in, in, you know, immediately before it arose. And so, you know, sometimes it's it's just a fact that risk comes out of left field and affects different companies in different ways. But if I was to look at the risk profile to our business today, then it's obviously radically less than it has been for virtually all of its history because we have now created a de-risked strategy in which the royalty income on uh, our relationship with Bridgestone is largely one-way traffic now and, and whilst one might take a view about the rate of increase and some people may be more, more bullish than others about the rate at which that royalty will grow and um, in the a remaining eight and a half year period, it's difficult to see any circumstances in which there is a, you know, a, a single catastrophic risk area that could affect the security of that income stream. So I think we have now a radically de-risked model. Um, however, we're also mindful that we must not waste that opportunity and um, that, that cash flow coming in, um, some of which will certainly be surplus and re re return to shareholders in one form or another, is also in the short term funding us, priming the pump for the sore business. And um, the way I've described that this morning in our board meeting was that you know, we are still stretching the elastic back on the catapult, but at some stage um, that catapult needs to let go and needs to generate um, a significant and growing income stream which at some stage will overtake the royalty stream coming from our relationship with Bridgestone and we're very mindful that making that um, investment in a controlled way um, you know that there, there will come a point when we are accountable for the results of that and uh, we have a great deal of confidence in the ability of the technology and in the ability of this team and the team around us here at Western to maximise the return on that investment. Um, but it is going to take a little time. And just, just to add to that, in the published accounts, in our risks and uncertainties, I added an extra column this year, which was an arrow showing whether that risk has increased, decreased or stayed as it was. And if you look at that, um, three of those risks of decrease, which is the obviously liquidity because of the deal we do with Bridgestone, 
Brexit um, hasn't been as much of a challenge as uh, maybe we could have anticipated. And COVID, that risk is decreasing as the vaccination program expands. The only risk that increased is the one that we've already discussed, which is the issues of supply chain. But as I mentioned, we are as best as we can at the moment managing that risk. Thanks, Melvin. And uh, a good follow-up question actually from Brian P, which is, uh, are there any upside surprises hoped for over the next 12 months? And, I mean, that's, that, that's, that's an interesting question to answer because there'll no longer be surprises if we talk about them now. <laughs> um, but 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 I, you know I understand the sentiment of the question, and I think uh, you know there are certainly significant upside opportunities against the expectations that are in the market financially at the moment. And I think you know we take the view as a board that the value of this company fairly reflects the uh, prospects for our business with ATMS and it fairly reflects the prospects of the business with Probe, but largely ignores the upside potential that we have in our sole business. And I think that the moment that we're in a position to go public on the success of some of the programs that we're working on in the background now, and, and you know, I, I don't want to be a hostage to fortune by naming names or putting timescales, but there's a lot of very valuable work being done in the background. And we recognize that when we're in a position to go public, that one of those is successful and that our technology is to be adopted by another major customer, then that will be recognized as an upside surprise. And it's certainly something that we'd expect to see factored into an increase in the value of the company and its shares. That's the big breakthrough that we would certainly hope to announce. Yeah, I'm going to pause for another 30 seconds or so while I wrap up and just keep an eye on any further questions. But um, you know, just to wrap up this session, obviously, you know, as I've said, it's only a few weeks since the last presentation and it's only a few weeks um, until the end of the year. But thank you, everybody who's tuned in for your interest in the company. It's much appreciated. Um, I hope you all have a, a very pleasant holiday season and stay healthy and stay happy. And uh, we look forward to updating you with the interims um, in February. I hope you found the session useful and interesting, if perhaps a little unusual. <laughs> Thanks, That's everybody. great. Thank you. Nigel, and thank you very much to the rest of the board for uh, updating investors um, this afternoon. Um, can I please ask investors not to close this session as we'll now automatically redirect you for the opportunity to provide feedback in order that the company can better understand your views and expectations. This will only take a few moments to complete, but I'm sure will be greatly valued by the company. On behalf of the management team of Transense Technology and the board, I'd like to thank you for attending today's presentation. That now concludes today's session and good afternoon to you all.